Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ms. Eister for inviting me here. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And I just want to say that I think that uh, these uh, discussions are very important because it uh, provides us with a basis of building a kind of national consensus on these things, which is absolutely critical, I think, if we're going to move forward with this. I also just want to say that uh, you know, we've had similar discussions now at uh, CPUT, DUT, uh, UP, and various other places as well. So I think that this is really fantastic, I think, that we were able to pull this together. Um, I want to just say that uh, I'm very pleased that we are locating this within a discussion on open science, because uh, this is really a, a small part of the big open science project. Uh, and the open science project, I think, has to, to have to stand back a little bit. Is the sound okay? It says, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I think the open science project is a, is a very large, big project, and this is a small part of that project, it seems to me. Yeah. Okay, so um, the way I think about this is that we are really embarking on a journey towards open access. OE 2020 is not a, you know, it's not the kind of the big open access, the the kind of the uh, uh, the final kind of point of stop for us. You know, we are, we, it's a it's it's a it's a step on a journey, and I think the critical thing for us to understand is just uh, you know what kinds of steps can we take to get to a kind of a final solution, if you like. Now, there's going to be a little bit of overlap today, and so Glenn Truran sitting at the back there, and I uh, actually spoke a little bit about what I'll do and what he'll do. And then, uh, 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 and then of course, there'll be quite a lot of overlap with what Gareth O'Neill is going to be saying. So, uh, so, so I think that, please bear with us if there is this overlap. And, and I'll try to kind of really keep it at, a, at the national level and, uh, and then Glenn will give you much more detail about OA 2020 and so on. Okay, so I think, you know, the first thing is that we really have to start with, you know, with what the, you know, what the objective conditions are. You know, that's what Blaine Zimande, as the General Secretary of the Communist Party would say, start with the, you know, start with the objective conditions. You know, where are we, you know? And the reality is that, you know, uh, we are in quite a bad place, really. You know, we have a stagnant economy, you know, even though we've won the, you know, the Rugby World Cup, 20, uh, you know, the Rugby World Cup uh, 2019, uh, which was great, you know, the reality is that we have a stagnant economy, huge unemployment, uh, violent poverty, uh, growing inequality. I mean, I, I've just noticed, in fact, that the inequality, Gini coefficient has come down slightly now, just a titch, so it's a good sign. Uh, uh, so the inequality is kind of flattening out, it seems. Uh, we've seen a kind of a massive erosion of democracy, right? I mean, just the huge corruption, uh, but in particular, for, with deep concern for the university system, at least, is this issue of the slide towards anti-intellectualism, you know, this idea that, so look, let me just give you a bold statement, you know, we've got a president of the United States of America probably the most kind of powerful individual in the world who doesn't believe science. You know? uh, so, you know, he just doesn't buy into the idea that it's important to understand what experts are saying. You may not agree with that. You know? But I have to tell you, we should not be sanguine. We shouldn't feel sanguine in South Africa because we've had our own kind of challenges around anti-intellectualism. And we really have to kind of pay attention to this because it's right at the heart of the project of the universities. It's just if, you know, if a society slips away from this idea that expert knowledge is important, science is important, if a society doesn't, kind of doesn't think that that's important, well, that's the end of the job for universities. You know? it's, 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 quite a, it's a really serious and important thing. We are, of course, seeing the you know, degradation of ethical society. You know, we've got all these commissions that are sitting now and all the stuff that's emerging there is just kind of... And you know, and you all know the big stories about your own province, like. But each province has got its own kind of stories. And so. uh, we're seeing an escalation of political violence, not just in South Africa but globally. You know, uh, but just to give you one hint, you know, when uh, you know, I, I think that 
you know, we don't pay enough attention, attention you know, to the fact that during the elections last year, the number of people that were murdered in KZN is shockingly high. You know? So there's political violence that is kind of rife. But perhaps the most important thing is this idea that we so easily construct the other, you know, this idea that we kind of really, uh, you know, clearly, you know, easily define people as kind of, you know, Nigerians or this or that. Or, and then, by the way, it's not just here, right? It's in Syria, it's a fight between different groupings. If you go to Iraq, it's a fight between different groupings. You know, the big battle between uh, what's going on in uh, America and Mexico is another story. The whole Brexit issue is about exactly about that, you know. Uh, so it's a global issue, you know. And that, of course, results in these massive global migrations. And then, of course, there's these rapid changes in the world of work, you know, kind of just the gig economy that you spoke about, you know, the issue around Uber and so on. Yeah. And, and, of course, we've got these massive public health challenges. So, so just to say that, you know, there's the reality, right? And then, of course, there's another reality. And the other reality is that we now have autonomous cars, aeroplanes, and you know, those of you who have traveled to New York, you know, if you take the subway to, you know, to catch the subway, uh, you get onto a train at JFK and then you look left and you look right and there's no train driver. You know, this train is just <laughs> traveling by itself. You know? uh, but like that, you know, autonomous trains, autonomous aeroplanes and so on. Uh, data warehousing, data analytics. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Elsevier and these publishing companies is that they are just like Google and so on because actually, you know, we are not consumers of that stuff. We are commodities, right? You know, we kind of produce the stuff that they sell. The ridiculous things, they sell it back to us, you know, <laughs> which is like the most ridiculous thing you can imagine. So we'll talk about that a little bit just now. Uh, well, I'm not going to go through all of these because you know about them already. It's kind of intelligent, deep learning computers. That's artificial intelligence, of course. Uh, population genomics. Uh, gene editing that's happening, you know, kind of changing kind of biological systems and so on. And there's all the stuff which is really huge changes that are taking place in the world, world of work. And so in some ways we are caught, you know, we're caught between all these big advances that are taking place and then the context that we're in. And, and you know, that's the condition of South Africa, that we have to somehow build a kind of a coherent approach to... Uh, to kind of to this kind of this world that we are in. For those of you who are interested, this kind of you know what's happening in the global landscape, right? So we've got these vast shifts in geopolitics and geoeconomics and so on. So you know, China is now the second largest economy in the world, right? It's happened quite recently, you know. Uh, by the way, if the trends continue, it will overtake the USA in a few years. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just about that. It's also about all the power relations in the world, the uh, shifts that are taking place there. Uh, then, of course, there's the geopolitics of knowledge. A few years ago, if you asked me, you know, where's the center of gravity of the, you know, of the knowledge, uh, knowledge production in the world, uh, the answer would be quite easy. Sitting somewhere between in the north, mid-Atlantic, mid right? That's the center of gravity between the USA and Europe. Right? Well, it's shifted now. You know, twenty percent of the world's scientists are now in China. China has overtaken the USA in terms of the number of publications it produces. All this, there's a huge change taking place. By the way, it's not just China; it's India, it's Japan, it's Brazil. Big changes taking place, which we have to. Um, by the way, by 2030, by 2030, twenty percent of the world's population will be on our continent. And then we have to come to grips with trying to understand what are the implications of that. You know, are we going to catch the kind of demographic dividend, as they call it, or are we just going to slide into increased poverty and so on? By 2045, it's predicted that, that we'll have, no, sorry, by 2050, it's predicted that we'll have 50% of the world's population. Clearly, that will change over time, right? But, you know. So again, I don't want to go through all of this, but just to say, you know, there are huge changes taking place in the world of work, in the, in the global world. And in higher education, again, uh, and um, I still kind of, kind of uh, refer to these things, there are all these digital disruptions that are taking place, uh, unbundling and the gig economy and so on. 
uh, those are in the university sector. No, I'm not talking about things that are outside. You know. uh, there's a growing distrust, as I mentioned earlier, growing distrust of science and so on. Uh, new forms of credentialing. By the way, this whole idea of kind of the blockchain university, you know, the idea that young people aren't going to come to university to take degrees, you know, that they're going to come to universities or come to places of learning to take, to take courses you know, just, and to build their resume with courses, not necessarily kind of putting together kind of qualifications. There's a story if, the, you know, if you want a job at Google, they don't ask you, what degree do you have? You know, they ask you, what have you done? You know, what courses have you done? And so on. Now, you know, we can ignore that. We can say, you know, that's not our job. That's, you know, industry-type universities are going to do that. We can do that. Well, we better start thinking about it, though, because it might be that, you know, the idea of the degree as a credential may not be as kind of valid 20 years from now as it is now. Um, yeah, and I'm, again, I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'm sure you've seen these before. And I think the important thing for us is really to imagine what are these big changes, these technology-driven changes? What impact is that going to have on, the, on scholarly publishing? And we've seen that already, by the way. You know, just kind of, if you look at the big publishing houses, you know, when they kind of take copy, ownership of copyright, uh, all we've done is we've taken what we are producing and we've given it to them. You know? And then they kind of, they commercialize it. You know, they kind of, uh, you know, they kind of put it in, back into the market, you know, and we have to buy it back from them. Um, okay. So, of course, you know, we, we, we can't forget what happened in 2015, 2017. The fees must fall, roads must fall, and so on. And there were huge kind of, you know, you know, I'll never forget, in October 2016 sometime, there were 18 universities were shut down. The other eight were kind of, you know, teetering on the kind of edge, you know. And there was calls going on from the department in particular saying, should we shut down the system? Uh, you know, so just to say that it was a really tricky time for us. The big questions you know, were, of course, around fees must fall and roads must fall and so on. But for me, at least, the really big issues were, you know, what is the purpose of universities as social institutions? That's what emerged for me, at least, from that, from that, from that period. You know? Who owns the universities? You know, just, you know, I was truly amazed at the time, and I've said this to Professor Peterson and the other vice chancellors, I was truly amazed that, you know, at the time when the universities were under such threat, nobody defended the universities. Not the government, not the private sector, not the students, not the communities. There was no defense of the universities. So, you know, the question is, who owns the universities? You know? And, the, you know, there's, and, you know there's, it seems to me that there's a catastrophic breakdown of a social compact, and that social compact was the one that came from the National Commission on Higher Education in 1995 and so on. That's broken down, and it seems to me that we need a new one. You know. And it's got to do with this idea of universities in society. Oh, sorry, I don't know what's happened there. Uh, yeah, sorry, wrong button. Okay, I, you know, I, I'm just going to read this one to you because you know it, it's just so powerful. It was written in 1956 by the chairperson of India's National Council on Science and Technology, and he says, "Why is it that science in independent India, despite all the investments in it, is not the potentially creative force it threatened to be during the nationalist period?" And it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. You know, just. Why is it that higher education, science, and so on hasn't delivered you know, what we were expecting of it? You know? uh, what is it that kind of impeded that and so on? Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but really it's about saying, well, you know, how do we kind of reconceptualize the university system in, on the basis of what has happened over the last 10, 15 years? And for, for me, at least, it really is about saying, you know, can we develop a higher education system that's that's kind of located within the social justice rubric, rather than kind of just you know, kind of going along, uh, you know, on a year by year basis, you know, without kind of really uh, paying particular attention about the relationship between universities and society. Okay. So, um, 
first of all, you know, the, why did we kind of embark on this project, right? And as uh, Professor Peterson indicated, the first thing is that we have unequal access to scholarly journals and information databases. We've got, you know, the rich universities, poor universities. We've got uh, kind of uh, the TVT sector. We've got uh, the government departments. We've got the science councils. Uh, but actually, there are a whole range of NGOs and so on who are busy with research, who have no access to journals, unless they're kind of connected to universities and so on. So th there's a big question about unequal access. And in particular, in the higher education sector, the vice chancellors are really particularly concerned about the fact that we have terribly unequal access to journals and so on. So it's a big issue for us, at least. Right? The second thing is that, you know, it's... It's fair enough that, you know, that some people argue that we should have a differentiated system uh, and that you know, we, we will have research intensives and so on. Well, we can do that, we can have that, and we do have that already by default. The big question really is that you really can't have those, diff highly, you know, those highly developed research intensives without also having well-developed teaching intensives. You know, those are all part of a system. You know, the, 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 the articulation between those two has to be work, has to work perfect, perfectly. And what that means is that where you have young people who are doing PhDs at uh, University of Vienna or University of Zululand, so they should have the same access to journals as people who are at UCD uh, or, or WITS or somewhere like that. So it's like saying we really have to work, work towards more equal access. And by the way, it's not just within the university system. It's, between, it's within the university system, but it's also outside the university system. Uh, secondly, uh, we've had this massive growth in postgraduate education. I'll give you a figure just now. But just to say that we've got this massive growth in postgraduate uh, education. And by the way, it's not just at the research intensives. It's happening across the, across the system. Uh, so, you know, we, by the way, if you look at the top five universities that are producing PhDs, you'll be surprised which are the top five. UCT and WITS are not in the top five. You know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> you know, so you know we have to pay attention to this. You know, we can't just kind of, you know, just uh, think about in this inequality of access as something that will sort itself out down the line. Of course, DST has got this large open science project, and we have to pay attention to it because it's not because it's a DST project, because it's so important for national development, as you were saying. Um, and then I mentioned this idea that there's a diffusion of knowledge production going on, knowledge work going on outside of the universities, in the NGO sector, in the not-for-profit sector, in the, you, you name it, you know, there's stuff going on there. Um, and, and then as Professor Peterson indicated, there's a growing unaffordability, escalation of the cost of journals, uh, foreign exchange instability, and of course, you know, there's this industry model which just really squeezes us all the time. Uh, so we really have to address this, and as I, you know, we have to start thinking about this as a social justice issue, that this is not just about uh, kind of fixing up the system, you know, but think of it as a social justice issue. And by the way, Glenn and I were at a meeting, uh, Open Access 2020 meeting in uh, Berlin, and uh, we put this forward, uh, because for the Europeans it isn't about social justice, you know, it's, some, it's another thing there. Uh, for us, it was a social justice issue, and we put that on the table. And interestingly, both Wiley and uh, Springer Nature kind of responded to that. Elsevier didn't pay any attention. <laughs> so, you know, interesting kind of point. By the way, we spend an estimate of between 500 and 600 million rand a year on journals. It's not a trivial amount, right? It's a huge amount. It's a huge amount. By the way, this doesn't include the APCs and so on. This is just subscriptions. Yeah. Okay. So just to give you some indication of where we are, right? See, we produce 3,400 PhDs a year. By 2030, we have to get up to 5,000. You know, uh, we produce more than 25,000 peer-reviewed research articles per annum. It's a substantial output. It's more than 1% of the global output. Right? By the way, that's, we, we are punching way beyond the size of our science system. Okay. We, but here's the important thing. See, although we have 1% of the share of the global output, we have a 10% share of articles 
in the top decile of the most cited articles in the world. So in addition to having a big increase in research output, we also have a very substantial share of high quality output, okay, which is very important. Okay. Right. And of course, you know, we have to worry about the ethics of research because you know, we produce 3,400 PhDs a year. If you ask me to vouch for the quality of those, I can't do that. <laughs> but I think there's still a big question about that. And, you know, and not just that, by the way, but also there's, a, there's some kind of odd behavior that's emerging around, the, uh, around our publications output. By the way, please don't get me wrong. You know, this isn't the bulk of our research. And so there's a small proportion of our research which we have concerns about. Okay, and then just very briefly to say, you know, the, the biggest output is in biomedical and clinical sciences, and then it's management sciences and so on, social sciences, physical sciences and so on. Okay, that's the kind of breakdown. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll leave the presentation, so I mean, I'm sure they'll just be here. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we try to kind of investigate the national site license approach. And there was a big study done by ASAF to try and kind of get to grips with this. And, and basically, first of all, I mean, I'm not going to go through any kind of detail about this, but just to say that it was just too expensive. You know, we just can't, couldn't afford to, we couldn't afford the deals. And more importantly, of course, we were deeply concerned about the fact that copyright would still rest with the publishing houses. And secondly, that the, basically the model remains the same. You know, the model doesn't change. All we're doing is saying, well, instead of, you know, University of Free State with its 25,000 students or whatever, that, that, you know, there'll be access to those students. All we were saying now is that this is going to now involve all 26 universities and the science councils, and basically the prices all just went up, right? Okay, so it's clearly unaffordable and non-sustainable. Okay, so we gave up the national site license approach. By the way, Brazil had a national site license. It's given it up. Pakistan. It's given it's up, they just, it's just an unsustainable model. Uh, so here's the, cr the crazy thing, we pay four times. We pay, you know, public funds are used for the research and for the research salaries. By the way, the bulk of the research funding comes from DHET in terms of research salaries and so on. You know, the public funds are dominant in the funding of the research that the researchers do. We pay for peer review and the editorial committees and so on, and APCs. And then we pay subscriptions in turn, like to, to read. You know. We pay four times. You know, it's ridiculous. So we have to change the model. Okay. And there are a number of trends that we have to kind of follow. So although we are talking about OA 2020 today, it's one model. And we have to pay attention to that model because it's a very powerful model. And I'll give you another reason just why we have to pay attention to it. But actually, uh, there are other models that are available. You know, there are new open access journals which are being initiated by scholars in particular fields. So for example, you know, when the Human Genome Project was started at the University of California, they, uh, they said, no, this is public money, public data. We're not giving this data over to the, we're not giving this stuff over to the publishing houses. They started their own journals, you know, which were free free journals. Physicists by, in my area, in particle physics, created something called archive. You know, so every journal article that was produced before it was sent to the journal house was put on this archive. And uh, it sat there and you could access it free of charge. You know? So, and of course, uh, Glenn will talk later on about scope three, which is kind of a really big experiment uh, from the physicists. Uh, um, there are no new not-for-profit publishing houses. And, uh, you know, we heard about these at, in Berlin, and by the way, the cost of production of journals just comes down because the profit motive is not there, you know. And the Elsevier made a profit of something like 40% last year, after tax, 40% profit. By the way, it's an unthinkable thing in the, for a company of that size. You know? So there are new not-for-profit publishing houses which do exactly the same that Elsevier and so on do. They kind of go through all the kind of rigorous peer review processes and so on and so forth. Okay, the Open Access 2020 program, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because Glenn is going to do that, is that we have to move away from pay to read to pay to publish. So essentially what we are saying is, 
You know, I publish in you know physical review B, very expensive journal. Uh, I'm not going to pay to for subscription. What I'm going to do is pay for the APCs, pay the APCs. But once it's done, it is open access. Okay. The big question is how do we pay that amount of money? So I'm going to come to that just now. Okay. And here's the critical thing that the copyright must reside with the author. Copyright, at the moment, we hand over the copyright. And we are saying that we should really retain the copyright. Okay, okay look, the, here's the critical thing. Right? See, there are a number of people who argue that actually, why are we, why are we working with this OA 2020 model or the kind of the not-for-profit open access? Why don't we just go to, I don't know what you call it. I don't know whether it's platinum open access or some color you know, is given to this this kind of open access, which is oh, green open access, right? Green open access. Why don't we go to green open access? Well, here's the issue. The issue is that we still have to have peer review. We have to have production costs. We have to have editorial work. And these cost money. They're not, they're not you know, they, you can't get those things for free. You know, you can say that academics are volunteering. Well, if the academics are volunteering, that's because the university is paying you know, them to do that work. You know. It's part of their kind of work, if you like. So I think we just have to understand that we are always going to pay some money for this. Uh, the question is, what's the basis of that? You know, of that? Uh, I'm not going to spend time on this, because Glenn will definitely spend time on this. But except to say one thing, and that is that we have to see this as a national project. We can't see this simply as each university striking a deal, each physicist or each, you know, each sociologist paying the APCs you know, individually. That's a crazy model for us. So we have to think about this as a national model. And I'll, 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 I'll spend some time about that just now. So just to say that we've had a number of discussions at the board. Uh, at every board meeting, we have a small. The board, by the way, of USAF is made up of the 26 vice chancellors and myself, 27 of us. And uh, we, so we have a continuous discussion about this. There's a broad agreement at the board that we should pursue the OA 2020 model. And what does that mean, right? But what it means essentially is that there's a broad agreement that what we'll do is try and keep the money that we are currently spending on subscriptions, not the APCs, the money that we are currently spending on subscriptions, that we'll keep that in a pool and use that for negotiating the Open Access 2020 transformative agreements. Okay, so what it means essentially is that, you know, WITS and UCT and so on, who have such a huge kind of investment in journals won't pull that money out, that they'll keep that money in a pool. Now, of course, you know, I don't know how this will turn out as we go ahead, but the point is really that we have to see this as a national project. By the way, it's not just the universities. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Okay. Uh, it's not just the universities. It's the universities, it's the science councils, it's government departments, it's private sector, higher education institutions, this is a national project. This is not a project just for the 26 public universities. Okay. And I just, I just want to say that, you know, that, you know, there's, there's a fair agreement now uh, between the universities and the science councils, for example, and the government departments, in particular DHT and DSI. There's a fair agreement that we should really see this as a national project and we should take it forward. There's still a need for much more discussion and so on. Okay, so at the moment, the project team is made up of USAF, SF, CHELSA, NRF and Cohort, uh, SANLIC, DHET and DSI. Uh, DS, DST is now DSI, right? Uh, and I think that the important thing for us is really to try to understand uh, how to kind of maintain a national approach to this. Okay, okay. so just before we Go on. So, so, so just before I go on, just to say what is the international situation? All the major European higher education systems have signed up and they, in fact, they're really at the forefront of this. And they've really kind of, by the way, we are, you know, when we talk to Elsevier, whenever I've had a discussion with Elsevier, you have the sense that they just, that they just, we are inconsequential, you know, because we're so small. You know, we produce 1% of the world's output, right? So, in fact, they don't care too much about us. In fact, when the Europeans were negotiating, they didn't care too much about the Europeans either. 
until China said. China came to the table. China, and Glenn and I were there when China, when the Chinese delegate, the Chinese leader of the Chinese delegation, said to the CEO of Elsevier, uh, listen, I'm talking to you, but please understand that I represent 20% of the world's scientists. Yeah. You know, so you know, that changes the equation completely. And of course, one of the most sophisticated kind of, the, one of the most sophisticated approaches is the University of California. And I hope Glenn will have a chance today to kind of describe what they're doing, because it really is fantastic. And just to give you one example of what they've done, right? One example. Elsevier has not agreed to a transformative agreement with the University of California. So all the academics at the University of California who used to do the peer review work for Elsevier withdrew. And they said, no, no. If you don't come to us with a good deal, we're not going to do any more peer review. Now, if the University of California does that, it's just a question of time before Harvard, MIT, and so on. By the way, the University of California, if you think, well, what, one university, you know, what difference is going to make? The University of California produces more research than the whole of France and the whole of the Netherlands. Okay. So it's a big system. It's a powerful system. It's the most powerful kind of public high education system in the world. Okay. And these others are all there, you know, kind of all kind of uh, in, the, in, the, in the scheme of things now. So what are the macro challenges for us? We have to build a substantial national consensus. And the idea is really to say that, you know, if there's a, somebody who's publishing an article in your department of sociology at the University of Free State, that there's no need for that person to kind of raise, you know, his or her grant money and kind of, you know, pay for the APCs, that we should have a national system that does that, okay? So in other words, to say that you know, this isn't about individuals finding the money for the APCs and so on, but that we have a national system that does that. Now, the point I was making earlier was that, you know, if we can keep the money in the pool, if you like, then we can use that money in the pool to begin to uh, pay for these APCs and so on in that collective way. And in fact, when Glenn speaks about scope three, I'm very proud of it because it's physics, okay? <laughs> but when Glenn speaks about scope three, You'll, you'll see how powerful this, this mechanism is. Okay. Secondly, uh, we have to confirm that this aggregation of resources. So we have to confirm, we have to get the MRC, the CSIR, the NRF, all the science councils, all the universities, whoever else is buying, or some of the government departments are buying journals. We should say to them, all of you, put your money in the pool, okay, so that we can start negotiating from a point of strength. Thirdly, we have to develop the capacity for data acquisition. In other words, you know, what we are struggling with now is just trying to understand how much are we paying in terms of APCs, you know? We, it's, it's almost impossible to determine that. But like that, you know, there's a whole range of other data that we need to kind of calculate, uh, to, to kind of enter this negotiation on a strong footing. We have to address the continental challenge. And the, Professor Peterson raised this issue. It's a really critical issue. It's the one Achilles heel of this project, this OA2020 project. See, we've got 600 million rand which we can negotiate with. Well, that's not the case in Malawi or Zambia. Or... So the one thing that we have to do is have a conversation, in particular with Nigeria, uh, Kenya, Egypt, and ourselves, the four kind of really big publishing, uh, although we are by far the biggest, but we have to start talking with those four, at least, amongst those four, to say, how do we adopt a continental approach to this? Because otherwise, it's just a question of time before our colleagues in other parts of the continent find that they are out in the cold, you know? because they don't have the resources to kind of enter this, this kind of this project, this uh, OA2020 project on, on their own terms. So that's a big challenge for us. And we already, we've already begun discussions, by the way, uh, on this issue. Um, oops, sorry. We have to kind of really manage the small, high-quality publishers to understand. See, the small, high, the small, high-quality publishers, in particular in South Africa, but elsewhere too, are saying that they can't go to this pay-to-publish pay to model. It won't cover their costs. 
So we have to find a way of working with them and trying to understand how to manage that. Because you don't want good quality journals to just disappear. Okay. Um, we have to ensure transparency. Because we discovered, for example, that we pay more for subscription to journals than Sweden pays. Yes, for the same journals. Because there's no transparency. Elsevier doesn't, there's a clause, you know, it says, there's a confidentiality clause. So you can't share the data. So Sweden told Elsevier Bagarov, you know, we're canceling, we're canceling the subscription and they released the data. And suddenly we realized that actually there's all these inequities in the world. We were paying more than Sweden. It's ridiculous. And then, finally, that we have to start thinking about a national structure that will kind of take this process forward. At the moment, we have an interim structure which involves all those organizations. But we need a kind of a structure that takes this process forward. And we're working on that now. It's so something like a, in the UK, they've got something called JISC, which, uh, which is kind of a, all the kind of information services that are required by the universities are managed by JISC. And so that's something that we are talking about now with Department of Science and Innovation. And with that, let me say thank you. I hope that was useful. <laughs>